So good morning, Christina Wilson, guidance liaison for those of you I haven't met. Um, while this space isn't ideal for any of you that were at our last guidance discussion group, which was in the uh, lecture hall, this is at least a little bit more conducive to discussion. And that's the whole goal of, of this group is to discuss. So for some of you that I can see that have children who have gone through the process before, I might call on you. <laughs> so be ready. <laughs> no, but really for your expertise, and you've gone through this, and you can add a lens and a perspective to other parents who might have ninth and 10th grade students, and you can offer your, um, you know, both your condolences, um, <laughs> <laughs> suggestions, and really can give a perspective of it's all going to be okay, or at least I hope that's the advice that you're going to give. Um, but that's really the goal of this discussion group is to be here for each other. It's really not a presentation. Um, I can tell you everything that we have on this agenda is going to be covered at some other time. So if you weren't here today for this, it's going to get covered. It's, it's, it's going to be out there in some way. We just thought it might be good to talk about these things um, uh, with you today. So I have invited Ms. Erin Brown uh, to speak um, for the uh, first two things on our agenda under what's happening, which is the college application process for seniors, kind of what we've just gone through and crawled out from under in um, the guidance office, and then what really a look ahead for our 11th graders, for our juniors, and what um, they can expect over the course of the next few months. And then um, she's going to go back to um, uh, the counseling office and I'm going to talk a little bit about course selection which really applies to all students um, because whether you have a ninth grader uh, tenth or eleventh grader actually it doesn't apply for our seniors but ninth through eleventh graders just to give you an idea of what that course selection process looks like um, and it will be a little bit different depending on, on your child and what grade they're in so that's our goal for today and then of course what you would like to discuss is at the end and I would just add that at any time if you have questions just please feel free to ask them and um, you know this is about you and what you need and, and that's what we're here for today so Aaron. Hi. good morning everybody it's nice to see so many people turned out today so thank you for joining us so um, as Christina mentioned um, just a little um, heads up on where we're at in terms of our guidance office we are winding down with our seniors um, still certainly seeing them they're definitely still a presence for us and getting those final questions answered still many students kind of processing some regular decision applications but November 1 was a big deadline for us and we got through that and we're very happy a lot of um, our seniors had applied with an early application of some type um, so many of our seniors are in good shape in that way we do have a financial aid night tonight, if you saw that on the calendar, which can be helpful if you need some information on that process, especially if this is your first go around, or even if it's not, really great to have that information from an expert in the field. Um, so with that, we're continuing to support our seniors as they finalize their process, and we'll um, be available to help them and advise them as they're starting to get some decisions and um, you know what that process entails for them as they move forward over the course of, of the remainder of their senior year. Something new we added this year that we wanted to highlight was our application clinic. Um, it was a different uh, approach to tackling some of the more logistical parts of the application process that all students need to do. So during the course of their process, they would be doing things like requesting letters of recommendation from their teachers, requesting transcripts, matching their Naviance and their Common App. And so we found that in tackling those pieces of the application in the one-on-one -on -one meetings with the counselor, it was taking up a lot of time and taking away from the more valuable time for the deeper conversation and getting to really advise them, getting to find out what was really working for them in the process, what concerns they had for the process. So we siphoned that off and created the application clinic. So we offered that over six or seven week period, multiple times a week, different times during the day so that it was accessible to all morning sessions, lunch, afternoon sessions as well. Um, each was headed by one of the counselors in the department and we were welcomed all students to come and join us and we could tackle those handful of logistical pieces in a group setting. This really freed us up. We felt 
not only for our students, but for you all as well as parents to get more one-on-one -on -one time, have those deeper conversations. And as we debriefed on it yesterday in our department meeting, we all felt like it was a great success. Did any of your students bring home feedback about application clinic? Anyone mention that at home? <laughs> yeah, they, they said yeah. That quick, quick, easy. It was a, it was a good good thing to do. Awesome. It, they, they were in and out like that. So. And they could come at seven fifteen in the morning. Just to give you an idea, we had four different times throughout the week. Uh, there was always a session at seven fifteen. There was always a session at two thirty in the afternoon, and then there were sessions that would run from A lunch through the middle period, which is ghost period, through B lunch. So we gave students three different times of day that they could really come see us. So depending on their schedule, we, we made ourselves available to them. And I think for the most part, that was the feedback we were getting, is that it, it sort of helped them feel like they'd gotten some things accomplished, right. felt a little bit more confident in that, because it is a process that is innately nerve-wracking and so they felt good about accomplishing X, Y, and Z in one sitting and then they could have their follow-up conversation one-on-one -on -one with their counselor. Um, so it was a, a, we felt like a good success. So we'll be looking to continue that next year with our rising seniors. So are there any questions about the senior process before I move on to juniors and where we're at and what's upcoming? You know, a lot of this has to do with, there's a two part, parts to this process in junior year. Absolutely. We ask a student, go and meet with your teacher that you think you're going to ask to write a letter of recommendation because you're giving them a heads up. First of all, you want to make sure that they're going to be the right person to write that for you. So that's a spring process. So they have a conversation, they give um, the teacher an actual form. And then during application clinic, which we just talked about, we teach students how to formally request through Naviance to have your teachers write letters of recommendation um, for a student. So what actually happens is a teacher will get an email that's generated through Naviance that says this student is requesting a letter of recommendation. When the teacher goes in to upload or send that information, they see the deadline of the college. That's not a Byram Hills deadline, that is the deadline of the college. So it's November 1 or November 15th or October 30th, you know, whatever it is, October 15th. And so absolutely the, te the teacher needs to meet that deadline. If that's not happening or if there's a concern there, the student or the, um, the student should come see both their counselor and also the, um, the teacher who's writing. So the teacher knows the deadline. The teacher knows the deadline, but it's not, it's not a, we don't impose a different deadline to right. teachers other than the one of just meeting the, the college's deadline. That's right. Christina, it's what we do do though is we do uh, thank all of those teachers yeah. for uh, uh, taking the time out to, uh, to write those letters. Some of our teachers have as many as uh, 40 to write and uh, they are compensated. They are giving, uh, given, uh, for every 12 letters they have to write, they are given uh, compensation for those. Um, so again, it's one of those things where it's not a contractual obligation for our teachers to do these. They are doing them because of their personal relationships with the students, and uh, we do send them gentle reminders. But the deadline is October 31st at midnight, and uh, putting anything earlier on them, I know that there's a lot of unease, and parents and students want to have those, um, those applications all set to go, but we really, um, We've never had a case, Christina, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where uh, an EA or ED e was held up because a teacher did not get a recommendation. Right, right. The thing that's really important to remember about the deadline is that the student needs to pay by the deadline. And that is the big deal. So a uh, student is not going to be, in most cases, penalized because uh, SAT scores are not received or a transcript isn't there by a deadline. Certainly there's a little bit of a leeway there. But if the student's application has not been received by the college or university by the deadline, that's the big piece. And that's um, what we make sure 100% our students are meeting. Believe me, there's a whole process. So we're going to get into it a little bit right now. But they will be told, this is the time. Okay, They'll all join a Google Classroom. Um, that reminds will go out they're going to see their friends walking around with these pink sheets and if they weren't paying attention to the Google classroom reminders they certainly are going to remember it at that point um, we remind our students but there's a time at which we feel like our teachers want to be told and want to talk about those conversations and it gives them plenty of time um, throughout the spring and summer to write letters of recommendation so they don't have to start writing those letters of recommendation in the fall it's never a bad idea for those junior parents in the room to start having that conversation with your child to say, you know, 
one of the teachers who, or one or two of the teachers you're working with this year will likely be the ones you'll look to approach for letters. So it's okay to start having that thought process earlier on so that when the time comes they feel pretty confident about who they're going to approach. Um, it's something that we'll certainly be bringing up in our upcoming meetings as well, discussion with your child. So Naviance is a wonderful system in that way. So we utilize Naviance for the majority of the submission of our materials from school to the colleges. The student has control over their Naviance account and that's the, the way in which they'll actually request transcripts, request letters, and then they list their schools, so the schools in which they've listed are the schools that the, the various materials will be sent to. So we have a separate process for outside letters of recommendation for students who um, do want to submit maybe a boss, maybe a, a mentor from outside of Byram Hills, right. and there's a process for that as well. Um, it's not as straightforward as what I'm explaining for Naviance, and so I would say that we, it's certainly something we cover in application clinic with the students, and we ensure that each student has, you know, um, the direct instructions of what they need to do. It varies slightly from student to student, so I couldn't say that there's um, a very specific set of instructions for how to do that, but we work with every student. Colleges are a little particular about what they want. So when it comes down to it, we want to make sure that students are paying attention to what the colleges, uh, colleges are asking for, not give them anything more than what they're asking for. They read a tremendous amount when they're processing applications. And so we want to make sure that the student um, appears to know how to read their directions and is sending exactly what is being asked for, nothing more. Um, so, but we work with every student. Some schools certainly have the opportunity to send an other recommender, and so we work with them on the proper way of submitting that letter. It should really always come directly from the, the source in some way. It should never come from the student, is really, I guess, a good rule of thumb, because it, it loses some authenticity in that way, and the college is going, it's going to raise an eyebrow. I think as a general rule of thumb, it's good to have a more recent teacher um, because the colleges like to get feedback on what the student has done most recently and it's a snapshot from the m most recent full year that the student has completed. However, I would always go back to the student and have the conversation and say, who do you feel is the very best person to write this letter for you? I would rather them <coughs> choose a teacher from an earlier year because they feel they have a stronger connection, perhaps they worked with someone both freshman and sophomore year, and there was some um, longevity there, as opposed to just selecting a junior teacher because you're supposed to select a junior teacher. There are some um, specifics that are put out by colleges in terms of really looking to the core area teachers as opposed to various elective area teachers. Um, so we want to kind of keep that in mind as well. So if it's not um, the strongest fit for it to be an English, Math, Social Studies, Science, or Language teacher from the junior year, or two from that, that year, it might be beneficial to go back a year if there's a better teacher and a better fit. I think the one thing that Erin is kind of touching on, and, and maybe I can kind of summarize here, is that this is a very individual process. Um, and there isn't uh, blanket statements about how to do all of this. If your child is a theater, um, mm -hmm. musical theater major, uh, what we're going to be advising that student versus possibly an engineer student who's applying as engineering <coughs> um, is very different. And that is why the um, we start the process in junior year working individually but with both students and with families so that we have a, a good sense of what you as a family want the outcome to be. And then we start to put things in place to meet that expectation and meet that outcome. That's very important for us. So this is going to look different um, for every one of you. I see uh, parents who have gone through this process before and if I asked you right now what your experience was, you could you say yes, some of this is right and, and absolutely or we didn't really do that or that didn't apply to us. It was very specific and um, I think um, if you want, you can maybe this is a good lead in to yeah. discuss how we start this process with our juniors and go a little bit into the junior process before we get to course selection and, and go that route. Absolutely. So um, coming up a little later this month on the 26th, it's a Tuesday evening, we have the Junior Parent Night. That's for parents only, where we'll first um, address uh, the full um, collection of parents in the auditorium and have a little bit of an overview, and then you'll have a breakout session with your child's specific counselor, and we'll go over the process um, and really break it down and, and provide an, another layer of detail to um, exactly how we go about supporting your child through this process and supporting you as a family as well. Um, 
just that same week we'll start individual student meetings. So we start the process by um, meeting individually with each junior in our caseload, start the conversation, <coughs> start to get a feel of what they're thinking about, what they're looking at, um, what are you know potential majors that interest them, what are the parameters that they're interested in pursuing in terms of their college search. We'll teach them how to go about utilizing Naviance as a great tool for conducting further college searches. They may come to us with some schools in mind. We'll look to augment that list with some suggestions of our own, and they should be walking away from that initial meeting with an initial list of schools to start exploring. <coughs> um, start discussing perhaps those who would be uh, good fits for letters of recommendation, talking about going on college visits and so forth. So just getting that ball rolling. When we return in January, after break, we'll start with our parent, our family meeting. So we'll meet both again with the student along with the parents <coughs> to continue the conversation because it's really a family process. And so we certainly want your input. We want to ensure that we are all on the same page about what that journey is going to look like. Um, we'll revisit the conversation we had individually with the student, what the outcome of that conversation is, any updates, perhaps there are some um, scores that have come out since then, visits that have been taken since then. So we kind of want feedback of where we're all at in the process at that point and then make plans for the next steps. And as Christina mentioned, each and every one of those meetings is beautifully different. That's what I love about this process is that it's, there's nothing cookie cutter about it. We may look to touch on some of the same points, but the discussion that follows is very different for each student because your child is different from his classmate, his or her classmate. And um, we want to make sure that the process is supportive of the journey that they're on. So we'll kick it off with that junior parent night later this month, followed by those individual meetings, followed by those family meetings. And then, as I always say to students and families when we're meeting, is it's, that's not the end of the road. Um, you're always welcome to reach out to us. We can always regroup. I'm happy to see students. We, our doors are open and it's wonderful that students come back in and update us. Oh, I went to go see this school. Let me tell you what I thought. Or I loved it. Or I hated it. Okay. And then we can provide more feedback and um, update sort of our process with them as well. I've not heard that in ter ever in my, my professional practice that they would not consider a student unless they have the opportunity to visit because as you said and as they um, responded to you, there, there's, that's not the um, situation that everyone's in to have that sort of availability to get on campus. So um, I do believe that it can benefit a student to get on campus and show that level of demonstrated interest. Schools do have different policies on that as well, um, but to hear that they've, they would not consider would be a bit surprising pretty, to me. It's pretty strong. I, I think there are ways sh to show what we consider demonstrated interest. What is demonstrated interest? Demonstrated interest is how a college is going to look at you different from a student, okay, who has maybe shown interest or not shown interest. So what does that mean? When the rep is here at Byram Hills High School, did you make yourself available to go? Okay, that's demonstrated interest. Maybe you as a family cannot physically get to that college or university. That's fine. Did you make an attempt to go to the meeting when they were here? Did you sign up, um, you know, did you give the college your email address so that the, when they're going to be local at the Crown Plaza and they're going to have an information session, you made an attempt to go there. Demonstrated interest doesn't mean now do 50 things and to show them, you know, that you're over interested, but I think there are ways that you can certainly show interest and um, possibly even getting the card of the rep that uh, that works with Westchester County, sending an email saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to get onto your campus. Here's what I love about your school and your institution and why I plan to be applying. So if you're finding that there are some colleges that you just simply can't get to as a family, I would suggest that you work with the counselor, with your counselor, and we can discuss other ways that you can certainly show them that, that you were interested. With the common application and others similar to it, there's been a big <coughs> shift with applications, it's become quite easy to apply to many, many schools where, you know, we're having those conversations with students and we're looking for them to be very mindful of where they're sending their applications. Um, the, you know, in, in the country as a whole, students can simply add, 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 add applications with doing very little additional work. And so a college, from their perspective, wants to know, did we just get added to the list or is there, a, you know, a deeper interest there? So. And th but that can be demonstrated in all types of ways. 
I think as a general rule, the smaller liberal arts colleges and universities, they'd like you to step on campus. If you if you can do that, that's probably a good thing. Your bigger uh, universities and institutions, they just simply can't track that kind of information, and um, it, it becomes less important. Um, that's just sort of a general uh, rule, but um, of course, to make a good decision, as Aaron said, mm -hmm. we want you to step on campus if you can, so uh, ideally. So Naviance um, is a platform that we, um, we can do a lot with it, and um, right now we're using it prim primarily to do college search and college information and resume <coughs> um, work. Our students actually gain access to Naviance as ninth graders um, this year with a program called Do What You Are and it's kind of like a um, it's a self-assessment um, um, like a Myers-Briggs type assessment and we give them access to that and then in 10th grade they still have access and we work with them on resumes and then we make more college specific things available to them in um, at this point in uh, junior year and of course all through senior year. So we, we phase in uh, the use of Naviance for our students um, um, developmentally. We think there are times when starting the discussion about college is, is more appropriate than others. And we found that um, phasing that in over the course of four years is, is the best way. We have students start the process of talking with student, with teachers about the process in their junior <coughs> year to determine who is going to be you know, a good person to write. And we talk to, to the teachers all the time and we um, have a very strong agreement and they are in agreement with us that they will not agree to write a letter of recommendation for a student unless it's going to be a positive one. Okay, and they have code words to tell a student if they don't think that they are going to be able to write that really strong recommendation. And what they typically will say is, I think that there's another teacher who might know you better. And when that does happen, and it's very rare that it does happen, student comes back to us and we regroup about who should be asked. So to answer your question, um, the letters are confidential. The counselors do not see them, but we trust that if a teacher has agreed to write, that they will be in the best interest of the student. So students are informed about our visits um, through the Naviance system. Again, we also post a, a very lengthy list on our door as well, and there are announcements made um, every day. And there's a board outside our office, so they're, they're getting that information in various ways. And they can pop into their Naviance account, see which visits are upcoming. We do ask that they register um, through the Naviance account so we have an idea of who to anticipate for each visit that's um, upcoming. And we'll also check with their teacher just to make sure that it's okay that they miss that class period. Um, in terms of who comes, it, you know, the reps will reach out to us to um, ask us to schedule a visit for them and based on you know previous interest and so forth you know we have well over a hundred schools visit us every year um, many of whom have students signed up for them and occasionally those who we might we meet with individually as counselors um, because we just happen to not have any students um, sign up for that particular period Oh, this is primarily, yeah, the seniors are the students who primarily visit with the, the reps in the fall. Um, they have a very specific and um, window of time because they're actually all pretty much heading back to their colleges now to begin reading and um, processing applications. So there's still a handful of visits trickling in for the remainder of this week, next week. Um, but, you know, we've already seen over 100 um, reps come through um, and visit with our students. And it's a nice extra way. At this point, many students are, are pretty solid on where they're looking to apply, but they may um, get some more information at this point and add a school. Um, but again, it's a nice way to kind of have that face-to-face. -face. Many of these reps are those who actually read for us and process our applications for our region. So it's a nice way for them to make a connection with our student at that point. Oh, it's also on our website. So okay. the, the list of the list of colleges is posted on our Byram Hills guidance oh. website. Okay, for all students or parents, whoever wants to view it, um, it's in Naviance and it's also posted on our door outside of guidance, and it's also made available in the announcements. So, so everything goes through that Naviance oh, system, yeah. right? So the student will select the teacher from a drop down. They'll request the letter be sent to schools X, Y, and Z, okay. and then the teacher. It opens basically a a window for that teacher to send the their letter electronically directly to the school. 
Thank you all very much. It was really great to see you all this morning. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. So I thought I would move along and talk a little bit about what really is important here, which is the coursework that your children are in uh, throughout their time at Byram Hills. Um, because quite honestly, the college piece isn't even a possibility unless your children are here and they're thriving and they're being <coughs> successful in the coursework that we have available to them. So for those of you with 9th, 10th, and 11th graders, um, the, co the course selection process will be starting in the month of, of January. And it's kind of a two-tiered process. In January, um, students have the ability to sign up for any course like science research or um, an AP course. And that takes us through January 6th is when we have some assemblies about what's offered to students. Also for our senior, our juniors who are looking to be leaders next year in things like mentor and peer leader, they'll find out about the application process and they'll find out about the application process to apply for any sort of AP um, uh, in their junior, sophomore, junior or, senior, or junior or senior year. And that will all happen um, during the first few weeks of January. From there, we move to um, March, and in March, your children will um, have in some of their classes, we will be pushing in and helping them consider coursework for the following year. Things like electives um, and um, other full year courses, maybe they want to double up on a language, maybe they want to begin taking the Global Scholars um, courses. There's so many opportunities for your children and what we start to do is we try to work individually with them and we work in small groups to help them get registered for the coursework that they want to want to take throughout high school. Okay. Sometimes it, we have to look to where, what do you want to accomplish by senior year and work back with prerequisites and so that those kind of individual conversations are taking place throughout the months of March, um, April, May and certainly into June. So um, what we do is in, um, in March, um, we push into mostly the English classes because we can be certain that every student has an English course. And so the counselors are coming in and we are actually helping them register while they're in their English courses. We're helping them register for their coursework. And then we're having follow-up conversations with the students individually as needed. For some students, it's pretty straightforward and they don't need a lot more uh, discussion about that. Um, for those of you who have uh, ninth graders, you have Ms. Hunt as your counselor, and she starts to meet individually with students and discuss uh, their coursework for sophomore year and even for farther on down the road. Um, for our juniors, that discussion really gets woven into these junior meetings that we're having starting in November, December, and then that continues in January and February because you can't really have a conversation about college without also talking about what courses are you going to be in in a given year. Um, our sophomores, we meet with them also during the month of March. Again, we push into their English classes and then we meet with students individually as needed. Um, so the, again, I think it comes back to this, this is a very individual discussion. There's no one right way to do the course selection process and it really is an individual process based on your child. Again, using the student who's probably going to apply for musical theater might have a very different um, selection of coursework in, in high school. A student who really wants global scholars and um, or science research is going to have a very different approach to the whole entire process. So we work with students to really make sure that they feel that they are going to be the most pre prepared as they possibly can um, for college and for life after Byram Hills and also to put themselves in the best possible um, position to um, have many opportunities as they go through the college process. So the process of APs is it's <coughs> by content area. So for example, a math AP, there might be a different process than there is in English, than there is in science. And so what the students find out in January is what is the process for the AP that they want to be considered for. Okay, and that information is made available in a number of different places. It's made available typically on the, um, the website for um, that content area. Also, um, the teachers push into some of, like if it's a math course, for example, they push into the math courses and talk about the process and what needs to get done. So students are given multiple opportunities to 
to do what they need to do. Uh, for some, you need to have a portfolio developed. If it's an art course, you need to submit a portfolio. And perhaps you need the majority of the school year to develop that portfolio before it truly gets considered. So depending on the discipline, depending on the subject area, the application process is a little bit different. But what is the same for all, of, all students considering APs is that that process begins in some way in January. So the college piece starts um, about uh, November 25th is when we start meeting individually with our juniors. And that will take us through December 20th. We, we try to have all of those individual meetings by that time. And then in January, we start meeting individually as, fa as a family. So right now, um, juniors, we're putting up a Google Classroom. And in that Google Classroom, we will be asking uh, students to make appointments with their, uh, with their counselor. We, we prefer a student to give us a time that works for them versus us assigning the time. So they'll start making that that time and somehow amazingly we get we get all of that done in the next few weeks um, uh, before December 20th so what we do is we give students um, a general overview of what to expect or what they can consider and so we kind of give them a taste of what's out there and then we give them the information we give them what's called fact sheet one and fact sheet two I have it listed on here where it lists every single course that a student could consider and um, they are instructed as to where to find more information if they want to apply. So that information is, is given to students in, in January during those meetings. The thing that we've always liked to do is we always like to keep families together. So if we get to know you as a family, um, if, if you had a child a few years ago, a number of years ago, we, um, we really just recall our families. So what we do is we go through a list and we designate a family that we've had in the past and we make sure that those students um, get assigned to us. And then from there, it's typically alphabetical. I always have the very end of the alphabet, S through Z. Um, there's somebody that pretty much always has the beginning of the alphabet, and then there's uh, typically two other um, students, so we or two other counselors that fill in. So that's really the process, so I guess it's kind of a combined, combined approach. We don't, but we do send out information through, uh, through a uh, blast about the Global Scholars Program because uh, just like in science research, it is an elective and uh, we want you know, everybody to have as much information as possible about it. Science research, they do invite uh, parents of uh, freshmen in um, if they have students who are interested in, in joining the program. Uh, Global Scholars, like I said, they just send out the information packet. Global Scholars is fairly new, um, but to give you just some, some basic information that, um, it, you know, it's sort of a look at the humanities and it's a deep dive into world issues from multiple perspectives. Um, it's, it's a three-year sequence, but unlike science research, you can enter that three-year sequence at any time. Um, you don't have to start as a sophomore and stay in it for three years. You could enter it as a junior or a senior. Um, we wanted it to be flexible and not tie a student and commit a student to three years. And there's no application process. The student would just enroll in the course. So we've made it, you know, one of our goals was to make it accessible and flexible for students. Yeah, the first year is a Global Scholars Seminar. The second year would be action re Global Scholars Action Research. And then the third year is Global Scholars Leadership, where the intention is those kids who have gone through the program um, in their third year become the leaders and they um, actually run uh, the Vox Summit that we're, uh, is a, it's an annual um, cultural enrichment activity that goes on in the school every, uh, every year. And they also go in and push in to the Global Scholars Seminar so that they're actually teaching a lot of our kids and it's a great way uh, for us to have additional ways to build student leaders. We, are, uh, we just launched a web page for it, so it's, um, it's an interdisciplinary program that involves social studies, English, and world languages, and you can go to either of those academic department pages and you'll see a link to Global Scholars from there, and we have information on the website now about it. I was just going to go over a few dates and then any other questions that you might have. I just wanted to highlight a few things um, on the agenda. Tonight is our college admissions and financial aid night. Uh, I think this is most beneficial to uh, parents of juniors and seniors. I welcome you to come out and hear Mary Lawyer from Siena College who speaks here annually. She just, she knows this inside and out. 
her role is enrollment management, uh, which really um, is an understanding of what it takes to attract the right students to an institution. And I think that she has a very good sense of that. And also the financial piece, return on investment, engagement. Um, this, is, this is a really uh, dynamic um, event tonight. So I welcome any parent can certainly come to this, um, but we do have it geared mostly towards parents of 11th and 12th graders. Um, we put on here our regular decision notification to guidance by November 15th. What is that? That's just if you are still applying to college and you are planning to put out an application at some point here, we would just like to know about it. Um, so that means by November 15th, we just want your child to have had a conversation with us. And for the most part, that is already done. Um, this is Byron Hells. They've already done this. We have our junior college parent meeting on November 26th. That's parents only. That is our kickoff to the college process where we meet with you, give you an overview of the process, and um, you hear from your child's individual counselor um, a little bit uh, in a smaller group about the process. On um, the 22nd of January, we have another uh, school counseling discussion group. I put on here the community book read. Um, Mark Brackett's book, Permission to Feel, is one is a book that we are going to be discussing as a community. We just had a, a book discussion on um, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be by Frank Bruni. It was a great discussion. I think it's, um, it's, it's important for us to be discussing these things. If you have any interest um, to read this book and come out for a discussion, um, I think that would be great. He has a lot of... Um, great information about um, emotions and its role in the world, its role in the workplace, and, and certainly its role in um, a school a school setting. And then uh, we have another school counseling discussion group in, in March. Uh, dates and times um, should be set, but always check the calendar <coughs> to make sure that we have those right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.